Alright, it's confession time. Despite having played Fallout New Vegas countless times, I've barely ever touched the DLC. I've played Dead Money and Honest Hearts, like, once, and I've never even touched Old World Blues or Lonesome Road. I understand this is sacrilege to a lot of fans. These DLCs are considered some of the greatest expansions to any game in the collective history of DLCs, and as further proof, Obsidian is a supreme developer of video games, and yeah, yeah, okay. The truth is, I've just never felt New Vegas needed spin-off adventures. The Mojave was such a compelling setting that anything else seemed kind of weak in comparison. Likewise, the story of the main game has so much momentum that it never really felt like a good point to ditch the Mojave to go off and do something completely unrelated. And going back after I ran through the main story doesn't feel right because the game just ends so satisfyingly. But I know I'm probably missing out on not giving these DLCs a go, so let's delve in and see if all the hype is actually warranted. If you're curious about all my thoughts on the original game, I did do a retrospective a few months back, and there's a link in the description down below. I'm gonna ditch my usual format for this one because I kinda wanna do something more objective and focused, otherwise, well, I'll probably end up being here all day. Has your life taken a turn? Do troubles beset you? Has fortune left you behind? This mysterious radio broadcast has been on repeat for a couple of centuries, give or take a few decades, tempting treasure hunters and prospectors with the notion of plundering another pre-war relic. Being a player in a video game, quest objectives and promises of loot are really all I need to investigate this thing. So I head off to the east where the quest marker takes me down into an old bunker. The place seems abandoned, save for an out of place radio left in the middle of a room directly in line of sight from the main entrance. So I skip over there only to be deafened by unexpected loud music, stumble to the floor and then wake up staring at an ominously angry looking sky. Old man Elijah over here then wakes me up with his loud Do what I say, and the caller will go. Refuse, try and run, disobey me, I'll kill you and find someone else. I don't know what the fuck this is about, whether it's a glitch or just poor audio mixing and obsidian's end, but it's annoying as shit. Every few lines, it's just... And we'll talk to him. He informs me that I'll now be doing his bidding, or else he'll pop my head like a GME rally. He's fitted my neck with an explosive collar, so clearly Elijah isn't out to win any hearts and minds. He's just out to break into the Sierra Madre Casino. He's needed countless sorry fools to get as far as he had, and I'm just another cog in his heisting machinery. When he's not blowing out speakers, Elijah is dancing around specifics, but some gentle prodding nets some finer details. The red mist is toxic crap, don't breathe it in. The villa's security took all my gear and sent it back to Mojave, so I'm basically naked. I got three other people, also with bomb collars I have to link up with, to coordinate the heist. And the collars are linked, so if one of us dies, we all die. This is to ensure teamwork because Elijah lost too many teams to blind greed. Yeah, that's it. Go out and get started. I leave Old Man Crackles behind and head for the police station. That's where I will find a giant, mostly friendly mutant to help crack skulls. If I'm going to be regularly getting into boxing matches with the locals, I might as well have a lumbering brute at my side. Walking through the narrow streets of the villa, I get to meet some of the creepy, suited up locals. The thing about them is that they don't stay dead unless they're dismembered, so I gotta remember to run over and slice them up to avoid being ambushed a few seconds later. This gets especially hairy when I'm being swarmed by a whole pack of them. Picking targets and killing efficiently is the key here. But the zombie locals are only part of the dead money experience. Getting lost in the villa is the other part. These twisting, samey looking streets are so easy to get lost in, and you're going to hear me bitch about that a few times before we're out of the villa because just, good god, it is so annoying to navigate. Real talk for a second here, Obsidian are great world builders, but not great level designers. Realistic level designs don't necessarily equate to good levels from a gameplay perspective. Fallout New Vegas suffered from this issue pretty hard, but damn, did Dead Money really amp it up. 
the villa experience is pretty tame for the first hour or so as I get used to the rhythm of its challenges. There aren't many ghost people, barely any traps, and it's pretty easy to find the police station since there's a few ways to get to it. As Elijah said, the station has some goodies in the form of weapons, armor, and supplies that will make fighting the ghost people a little easier. But best of all is what's locked in the cage, a deranged super mutant who is going to be my guide through the streets for most of the villa romp. I have to play a voice recording to gain the privilege of talking to God through the bars of a cage. No, really, that's actually his name. It's, it's God. Probably because he's the more cerebral personality floating around in that oversized head. But just like God, he's a total control freak and completely unreasonable. The flip side is Dog, who just likes to eat things, fight things, and listen to whoever lets him do those two things. Oh, and he also hates God. God doesn't hate Dog, he just wants to take care of his simpler alter ego, and that usually means locking him in a cage. Usually that cage is more metaphorical, but this time around it's actually literal, and Dog really hates the cage. I get to argue with God, but he's not going anywhere. He'd rather starve in the cage than let Dog out and do old man Crackle's bidding, so I'm forced to play a tape that puts God in the metaphorical cage and brings Dog to the forefront, allowing me to let him out of the physical cage. This is a mutually beneficial relationship because this lets Dog eat and makes it so that I don't have to mutilate the dead people, because Dog will just rush up to the downed foe and chew their face off. Really, I don't even have to fight that much anymore thanks to Dog. This lets me save Stimpaks for more useful things like stepping into bear traps. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's time to talk about these little bastards. So with Dog in tow, I gotta head into the next part of the villa in search of the second companion, and this part of the villa is Trap Hell. There are the clouds of toxic red gas I've been encountering on occasion when picking up Dog, but just a lot more. There are also landmines, grenade bouquets, pressure plates, and bear traps. <coughs> so <coughs> many <coughs> bear traps. <coughs> I see. This part of town is also a lot more of a pain to navigate with lots of impromptu detours and roundabouts. It's uh not fun. Look, I don't mind a challenge, I even kinda like the whole having to scavenge like I'm level 2 again, but this part of the DLC is more frustrating with what feels more like gotcha moments than genuine challenge. Also, the ghost people are getting more damage spongy, depleting what little resources I've been able to scrape together. Ballistic weapons, which is what I'm specced into, do less damage than melee weapons, which I have virtually no skill points or perks in. That's on top of ammo being scarce. You'd think the scare shit would be very effective, but apparently not. Comet was never this game's strong suit, and while I guess I could sneak around them, sneaking is even less of its strong suit. But it is what it is, and I guess this does help contribute to the oppressive atmosphere of this DLC. Anyway, the villa segment, while not having overstayed its welcome yet, is starting to get annoying. Fortunately, I'm able to get to the second companion eventually. Unfortunately, he's about as willing to trust us as God was, and this time I don't have a tape to trip his alter ego into obeying me. But between the linked collars, my character's silver tongue, and the necessity of the plot moving forward, Dean eventually agrees to go meet up at the fountain. Then it's just a matter of reaching the third and final companion. This brings me to the medical district, which is actually not as difficult as the section of the villa Dean was in. I get into the med clinic and meet the holograms that Sinclair, the owner and chief designer of the villa and the Madre, installed all over the place to handle the day-to-day -day operations and security. These things are pure future space magic, completely invulnerable and capable of shooting out beams of energy from their heads if they are alerted. It's best to avoid these things at all costs. Like all technology though, they are only useful when turned on, so just find the hologram emitter or the terminal they are linked to and cut their power. Problem solved. Hologram soldiers aren't the only nifty future tech floating around this clinic, there's also a buttload of auto docks. Inside one of these giant soup cans is the third companion, Christine, whose name my character just magically divines from thin air because she's incapable of introducing herself. So Christine seems to have had some sort of mishap with the auto dock and lost her ability to speak. It's not clear yet because the only form of communication she has is pantomiming. Unfortunately, this is all told to us through text, removing a lot of the effect and just making things seem really odd. 
especially since my character picks up on things I'm not, acting as a translator. It's a cool concept for a character, but the execution leaves a lot to be desired, and the novelty wears thin very quickly. So, I won't be chatting with Christine much for the time being. Then it's back to the fountain to listen to Old Man Crackle some more. Now for the festivities, and your part in all this. The owner of the Sierra Madre, for whatever reason, keyed the grand opening to the gala event itself. Now that the band is back together, it's time to put on a show. The opening of the casino is linked to the gala event. Aside from being one of the better varieties of apples, the gala event is also a grand spectacle of music in the streets and fireworks in the skies. This is why we needed four people to get into the casino. There are four stations that need to be operated for this thing to actually work, and those four stations are scattered around the villa. So yeah, that means escorting each companion individually to different spots in the villa, which is going to double the time spent in the villa that is definitely wearing out its welcome at this point. I took this time to finally get to know my companions because getting lost in the trap and mutant infested villa just didn't sound like my thing yet. The good thing is that all three companions are super interesting. In my opinion, they actually overshadow a lot of the companions back in the Mojave. Dog slash God probably has the most going on and I could do a 20 minute analysis of his personalities and their bigger thematic implications, but I'm getting enough of that for my college English classes, so I'll just summarize it like this. Dog slash God? He deep. Dean is a standoffish prick and would fit in well just about anywhere in the wasteland. He's just completely focused on his own needs and survivals, but what's even cooler is that he was here before the bombs fell. He was one of the invited guests and even performed at the theater. Now you'd think he'd be a wealth of knowledge and backstory, but he's very tight-lipped. He's been trying for two centuries to get back into the casino and probably knows more about this place than anyone else, Elijah included. Certainly he knows more about surviving all its bullshit than anyone else alive. He even knows how to make a martini out of the toxic gas clouds. He's got a sharp tongue and his comments do a lot to add some color to the story. Christine isn't able to talk, but she's already mastered how to mime, and my character has mastered picking up all the signals she's throwing down. She came to the Madre searching for Elijah. They are both from the Brotherhood of Steel, which we the players know about if we were paying attention to the deeper lore back in the Mojave. Elijah was responsible for leading the Mojave chapter of the Brotherhood into a tactically poor situation at a giant solar power plant when the NCR rolled through and evicted the Brotherhood. This almost led to the destruction of the Mojave chapter and the disappearance of Elisha. Now he's trying to break into a casino filled with very unique technology that is all mostly preserved thanks to the toxic cloud and all the security. And Christine is searching for him to presumably make him pay for his crimes. He separated her from her girlfriend and that's all Christine is able to communicate using hand gestures and facial expressions. Hopefully she'll be able to communicate more effectively later because she's got the most interesting backstory and it actually ties in with the deeper lore of the base game, which is something I really dig. But yeah, I guess it's time to get everyone to their stations. There's no need to drag out this part. It's literally the same thing I did earlier, but instead of picking up companions, I'm um, dropping them off. Each companion needs to be convinced somehow to stay at their stations. Christine needs some computers activated to keep her out of harm's way. Dean wants holographic security patrolling the streets when the music starts and the ghost people go nuts. And God needs to be brought out of the cage again and convinced to operate the switches for the fireworks show because Dog is way too simple to be able to make sense of the instructions on the wall. And none of these tasks are tricky, just speed bumps to make it seem like these characters have a will of their own and are concerned for their own well-being. I make it to the bell tower where I trigger the gala event and... Yeah, it's not a visually impressive thing. I thankfully don't have to go rescue my companions a second time because once the event kicks off I get directed back to the fountain and then it's to the gates leading to the casino itself. I guess it was just understood we'd all race back on our own or something. Or my character just decided to abandon them, who really knows. But once inside I find my companions unconscious on the floor and for the second time in the past few days I'm knocked out waking up to find the gang split up for a third time. Obsidian decided to recycle finding the companions as quest objectives again because that's exactly what Old Man Crackles tells me to do once I'm vertical. I'm free to just kill them now though, and in fact that's what he suggests I do. They all lived out their usefulness and I proved myself to be the most reliable of the bunch, so they are really just loose ends for Elijah. 
but I'm pretty well attached to these three and would rather not murder them, so I start the process of tracking them down to, I guess, rescue them. First, I gotta get the casino back up and running, which means restoring power and lifting the security lock down via some terminals and switches in the casino. Doing this shuts down the security holograms and opens up the casino for gambling. Flush on Madre chips, I turn them over to one of the magical vending machines that spits out over 400 stim packs, so I will literally never be wanting for stim packs again. Elijah tells me Dog is in the kitchen trying to blow up the casino, so he wants me to head down there and deal with the situation. By deal, he of course meant murder, but I opt to sneak around and shut off the gas valves he opened. Once the threat of spontaneous combustion is quelled, I'm able to confront the mentally deranged mutant and start playing head doctor by using speech and medicine to cure him of his split personality. It's a surprisingly touching moment, actually, as God is seen just trying to reason with his deranged, depressed, and self-destructive alter ego. They both find inner peace once brought back together, and this leads to some wicked amnesia for the dude who is left standing in the duo's place. He thanks me despite not really knowing why he feels grateful, and then it's off to find Dean. Dean managed to get himself into a pickle in the theater when he triggered the security holograms who just won't let him leave. And now that I'm in there, well, we're both kind of trapped. The two of us coordinate and I'm able to soothe the security system's paranoia by playing some calming tunes courtesy of Dean himself. I also get to learn about Dean in the process and uh... Oh boy, is he a real piece of shit. So he came to the casino with the express intent of robbing the place blind. And I don't mean he came back after the bombs fell like Elijah. No, he came before the bombs fell to rob Sinclair because he always thought Sinclair was full of himself. To teach the goody two-shoes some sort of lesson, he employed Vera, another singer who Sinclair was utterly obsessed with. Actually, it was for Vera this whole place was built because he was so in love with her he wanted to protect her after the bombs fell, so that they could live happily ever after in the lap of luxury. But things didn't turn out so great because Vera had a painkiller addiction and Dean, in an attempt to be even more irredeemable, used that addiction to blackmail her into turning on Sinclair so the two of them could rob the rich fool blind and break his heart at the same time. Dean needed Vera because she was the literal key past so many of the security systems, specifically the voice locks to get into the super protected vault in the basement of the resort. I guess the bombs fell and Dean got locked outside and rather than using the end of the world as a chance to turn over a new leaf and live a better life as an immortal ghoul, he uh, just became obsessed with breaking into the casino to prove a point to no one but himself. Yeah, Dean is, uh, he's got some problems. But I still kind of like him because he's the type of character you'd expect to be able to survive in such a miserable place. Literally, his hatred and hubris has kept him going for two centuries. That's quite remarkable. It's a shame we can't run power plants off of hatred and pride. Dean would be almost an unlimited source of energy. All that's left to do is find Christine, who is taken by casino security to Vera's room because, as it turns out, she can talk. You made it. Good to talk. I'll keep this quick in case my voice goes out. Do I? Sounds off to my ears. Hard to tell. So Dean abducted her when she got to the Madre and threw her into an auto dock and activated a protocol meant to heal Vera's voice when she was suffering from an infection that strained her vocal cords. This made it so that Christine will sound like Vera and allow her to get past the voice locks so long as she has the right passphrases. This was, once again, all part of Dean's breaking plans. Christine has a lot more to say now, though most we already knew. She reaffirms her mission to hunt and kill Elijah, which, after seeing all the shit he's done to everyone here, yeah, that makes perfect sense. She mentions she tangled with Elijah at a place called The Big Empty and she was with some strange courier who helped her track Elijah. Elijah left the place, but not before locking Christine in a clinic where she was experimented on and suffered brain damage. 
which has forever ruined her ability to read and write and explains the scars on her skull. She is able to shed some light on what the deal is with Vera, whose hologram ghost was caught by the security system and is now on a constant loop as I wander the suites. So Vera ended up admitting the plan to Sinclair, who went bonkers and set the security team loose on all the guests in the casino. Vera got trapped in her suite and could only sit there and listen to the butchery and live with her guilt until she eventually killed herself with her pain meds, which she had been taking because she actually had an undiagnosed terminal illness. So she died alone and afraid in some hotel room, separated from her lover after the world had ended. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty fucking depressing. Christine uses her new voice to unlock the elevator down to the basement where Elijah is hiding, who is still unaware I've turned against him and plan on killing him. I mean, I was never actually on his side at all during this thing, considering, you know, he put a bomb collar on my neck. But, okay, now I at least have the means to get even. The basement is a lot like the villa, but mercifully shorter. Tons of traps, security, and there's also that red mist again. There's some platforming puzzles that probably shouldn't be as difficult as they are, but I got the coordination of a drunken elephant in games. So I wind up taking a few spills. Finally at the vault, I'm able to break through and lift the security lockdown and get Sinclair's account of all that went down the days following the bombs. And that's able to fill in the last bit of story left. So Sinclair immediately regretted turning his security against everyone and locking his lover in the suites, but the security lockdown trapped him in the basement of the casino. He did all he could to undo the mess he'd made, but the damage was already done, and all he could do was waste away in the basement, unable to reach his lover upstairs. As a final sad twist, the emergency broadcast that was supposed to activate to alert rescuers about any survivors at the Madre ended up getting corrupted and resulted in that invitation broadcast to play on loop, luring treasure hunters to their doom for two centuries afterwards. Elijah contacts me again, expressing joy I've managed to break into the vault and lift the security lockdown. This has given him control over a lot of the systems of the Madre, which he plans on using to make his own nation. He'll use the cloud as a means to protect his lands along with the security holograms, auto docks to keep people healthy, vending machines to keep people fed, oh, and uh, slave collars to ensure order. You know, just in case the other shit sounded like a good idea. So. Yeah, this whack job needs to be taken out. I managed to convince him to come down, but really, that's just because he's sick of my shit and wants me taken out for good. He turns the security on me and it's a battle to the death, but he ends up eating dirt and getting sent down into the bowels of the casino. All that's left to do is rob the vault of as much gold as possible and escape before my collar detonates from some sort of dead man switch. With the escape, my companions and I split up and continue on with our lives. Dean heads to Mojave, where he will no doubt fit in well. Dog slash God goes on to live a new life as a new psyche. And Christine stays at the casino and keeps an eye over the place like some kind of warden. All in all, Dead Money is actually a pretty enjoyable experience. The villa definitely gets long in the tooth, but having to give up all my powerful endgame gear for a few hours of scaving and survival is a neat twist. Especially for an expansion whose whole premise is about getting rich. Being stripped of all my precious possessions at the front door is definitely a thematically fitting turn of events. But the DLC definitely hits its true stride once inside the resort. The story opens up, the backstory is developed, and the characters really come into their own. The resort is a lot more enjoyable to explore than the villa thanks to some much needed variety, and they even snuck a casino with working games in there. It's all brought to a very fitting and satisfying conclusion with all sorts of lofty thematic ideas being touched upon and worked into the story and the characters. Letting go is something that's repeated constantly during the story, and the fact that your greed can get you trapped and killed numerous times in this DLC, even at the end with the vault and the bars of gold, says a lot about how much thought and care went into this DLC. It also ties in well with the events from the Mojave and does a ton of foreshadowing for future DLCs. Howdy. My name is Jed Masterson, and I'm a caravan boss for the Happy Trails Caravan Company. If you're hearing this, I have a job offer for you. Happy Trails is organizing an expedition north into Utah, off the Long 15, and we need people. 
Like the previous DLC with Honest Hearts, I heard about the expedition heading to New Canaan via a global radio message, but unlike Dead Money, this message is an advertisement and not some sort of cryptic pre-war sirens call meant to lure me into a trap. So I head up to the Northern Passage where a party is already assembled. Jed Masterson is running the show here and needs one more member so the party can set out. I'm uniquely qualified since I'm a courier and got a Pip-Boy. The Pip-Boy is going to come in handy for its topographic maps that will let us find the elusive mountain passes through the rocky Utah mountains. So I land the job and after slimming down what I'm carrying to just a handful of weapons and armor, I'm able to chat up with the rest of the crew. Most of them have little to say, but then I come across this goofball Ricky, a doped up chem addict who is playing some sort of con here to score what he thinks is easy cash to presumably support his habit. He says some dumb outlandish shit that reveals he's in way over his head, and I just put the fear of real life into him when I tell him he's bound to run out of chems on the trail and he understandably fucks off back to New Vegas. It turns out I accidentally saved old Ricky's life because immediately upon arriving at Zion, the party is attacked by a hostile local population, leaving me the sole survivor. A little miffed, I'm not going to make contact with these legendary new Canaanites who are supposed to be pretty wealthy and badass. I wipe out the remaining attackers and head deeper into the canyon where I meet Follows Chalk, who is uh, genuinely surprised I'd manage to survive a white legs ambush. He gives me the lowdown on Zion as we make it back to his tribe's camp so I can meet his leader, Joshua Graham. There are three tribes occupying Zion National Park here. The Dead Horses, the tribe he belongs to, the Sorrows, who are a group of friendly pacifists in the northern part of the canyon, and the White Legs, a very hostile group not native to the canyon, moving in to swell up the other two tribes. Zion was peaceful until the White Legs came along, but it's okay. Joshua and another new Canaanite, Daniel, have a plan to deal with the White Legs. Seeing as I'm from the outside world, Follows Chalk correctly deduces that Joshua would like to meet me. And upon arriving, I get to lay eyes on a man who's only myth back in the Mojave. Joshua Graham, aka the Burned Man, attempted to conquer the Mojave Wasteland five years ago in the name of his ambitious boss, Caesar. Graham failed, and as punishment, he was lit on fire and tossed down a cliff, which it was said he didn't even scream on his way down. But he didn't die, and rumors started to spread that the Burned Man still walks the wastes. After his more, uh, literal firing, he returned to his old home region and was welcomed back in by the dead horses for some kindness he showed them many years prior. But then the White Leg Nation attacked, and he got back to his old tricks of militarizing tribes and gearing them up for war. He's glad I happened by, although he's genuinely troubled and sympathetic to the loss of my caravan. Though, in all honesty, he probably gives more of a shit than I did. He's quick to enlist my help, though, so... Clearly, he's not all that concerned either, and asks me to make contact with his other Canaanite counterpart, Daniel, who is working with the Sorrows. You see, everyone in this canyon has some sort of grudge against those white legs. On top of them invading the horses and Sorrows' sacred, peaceful Zion, they also burn New Canaan to the ground. You know, the town my expedition was chartered to visit. They didn't succeed in wiping the Canaanites out, but their home had been razed to the ground by their war chief, Salton Moon. So you could say Joshua and Daniel also got their own personal beef with this guy. And to top it all off, they did it at the behest of Joshua's old boss Caesar, partially to remove a threat to his rising empire, and partially just to dick over Joshua. So we got a lot of pressure building up in this canyon, and it seems I'm the one who's going to strike a match and burn the gas. He gives me Fowler's Chalk as a guide to the treacherous park, and the two of us head back into the beautiful, rugged wilderness. Along with Follows Chalk and the mission to seek out Daniel, Joshua also leaves me with a laundry list of items he wants me to retrieve. Supplies and stuff like that to bring back to the Sorrows so they can beef up ahead of the planned assault on the White Legs. And now free to explore the park for myself, the problems with this DLC really begin to show. The first one being why I'm just going to cut this one shorter than I did with Dead Money. It's kind of just boring. The environment of Zion National Park is great. It's got tons of nice views, and if you can look past the obviously dated graphics of this engine, it does a lot to feel like an untouched paradise that it's meant to be. But navigating it sucks, the map is borderline worthless, and there's just not much to actually explore. It's a park, not a city, so there's very few structures, and what structures there are, are just park ranger watchtowers, campers, and little shops. They're mostly unlooted because the locals believe these places to be taboo, so I'm able to find some old world plunder, but as a near max level character, none of it is essential or, well, even really useful. 
Exploring can be intrinsically fun, but Zion doesn't have enough visual variety to tap into that desire. After literally about 10 minutes in a couple of shops and caves, I was already kind of tired of the locale. And on top of all that, there just isn't much variety in local life. One of the joys of New Vegas was learning about the local people and fighting hostile wildlife. The local tribes all feel samey and are all woefully underdeveloped, and the wildlife is literally all stuff we've seen in Mojave. Yaguais, geckos, bugs, and mutant plants. And in three paragraphs, I've basically said all that can be said about Zion. Pretty, but boring. So after getting my fill of the park, I started hitting all the quests, which just involved fetching items from locations and then trucking it up north to see Daniel. Daniel and the Sorrows are the peaceful counterpart to Joshua and the Dead Horses. These people don't want war with the White Legs. The concept of conflict is so against their nature that Daniel is just planning on retreating with them out of the canyon. He believes Joshua's plan is just going to result in more war, and seeing as the world is now a bombed out wasteland, he's of the mind the world has seen enough of that. Instead, he asks me to do a few more tasks to cover their retreat. But the question remains, where are they gonna go and how are they going to survive in a world that is literally constantly at war? It's never really answered, and well, I guess we just gotta take this on faith. Upon leaving the narrow canyon the Sorrows call home, Joshua intercepts me and implores me to convince Daniel to see the truth that the only way they will win is by killing the White Legs. The fact that there's no diplomatic option, no middle ground, or even an opportunity to approach the White Legs and learn about their side of things is what drove the point home that this DLC wasn't Obsidian's usual quality work. The whole thing felt so Russian and complete, you know, more so than the base game. And in the spirit of that, let's just rush through the rest of this and get on to more interesting matters. I complete the second set of chores Daniel gave me, and then it's time to choose. I already know how this is all going to play out. I either choose to help Daniel escape with the sorrows, and this probably leads to the white legs getting to eventually destroy both tribes, or I agree to go to war and this militarizes the two peaceful tribes, turning them into another White Legs. It's a half-baked non-choice that glosses over any real subtleties in an attempt to appear mature and realistic. But then it won't get to answering the whys that would make that a valid, thematically sound conclusion. I agree to side with Joshua because I'd rather have a bunch of militaristic tribes running around that are at least friendly to me than a bunch of militaristic tribes running around that are hostile towards me. Joshua's happy, Daniel is devastated, and it's time for a very long shooting gallery segment to wrap up this underwhelming adventure. We trek across the entirety of the map to the White Legs camp and punch through it to salt in wounds. He tries to appeal to me for mercy because Joshua is doing his unyielding slaughter thing he's known for, and I just tell him the wasteland is better off without his tribe running around committing atrocities. By Cur, you devil! There. That's it. It's finished. When they hear what happened here, the White Lakes will crawl back to their great salt lake. If Caesar doesn't kill them, they'll wither and die like the cursed mongrels they are. Yeah, good riddance, I suppose. I get the ending slideshow that spells out exactly what I expected and then get spat back out into the Mojave having traveled the exact route I took with the expedition to arrive even though they said in the beginning we couldn't head back the way we came. I spent a grand total of 3 hours in Zion and that felt like 2 hours too long. Alright, here it is at last, the big one. This is the DLC everyone loves talking about, and this is my first time actually playing it, so let's see what the hype is all about. There's a crash satellite in a parking lot on the south side of the map, and if you interact with it at night, you get a dialogue box that, in the most fourth wall busting way possible, explains you can't come back to the Mojave for reasons. So prepare carefully and make a hard save. No more of that nonsense with getting limits put on what gear you can take though, so you can at least have fun with that. My character is magically transported to Big Mountain, also known as Big MT or the Big Empty to the people of Mojave. A secret pre-war science lab that has been responsible for many breakthroughs before the war and many scientific abominations since. My character wakes up on a balcony overlooking some of the research facilities with a cool breeze up his, uh, back. 
Something has happened and it feels different, at least according to the dialogue box. I'm alone in some sort of apartment and nothing here seems to be working, only an elevator that will take me down to the think tank. Down in the dome, I come face to face with several unique robots. They like to talk a lot. Like, a lot. They inform me they've taken my brain for, once again, reasons. Along with my heart and my spine giving me the brainless, heartless, and spineless perks. And this really sets the tone for the whole DLC. If the last two DLCs were super serious and usually depressing, this one is just dumb silly fun, which is one of the things people love most about it. The opening dialogue is quite literally 40 minutes to an hour long and is full of colorful humor, wordplay, fourth wall shenanigans, and my personal favorite. We feared you would be tempted to explore Big Mountain Crater and examine the many amazing non-mandatory research labs that lie off your designated path. The many such optional explorations are discouraged. Work hurriedly as if you have blinders on and leave curiosities and items of interest alone. So many sciences and developments. Pass them by. Let impatience and the desire to simply finish, to end it all quickly and carelessly guide you. But then you get jokes like this. Ah, that is correct. You must walk upon your many penis feet. You should be ashamed. So they snatched my brain for some reason, they don't disclose what that reason is, and uh, there just might likely not be any reason at all. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of sensible, rational decision making going on around here these days. These robots might just be completely busted, and to further that point, Dr. Mobius, another similar looking and slightly more deranged sounding robot, calls the think tank to harass them and remind them not to approach his lab in the Forbidden Zone or leave the think tank in general. This is where the player comes in. With my brain removed, I have a much higher degree of mobility in this place than the brainy robots. There's security systems all over the place inhibiting anything with a brain from getting around. They want me to first gather some key technology scattered around the big empty that will allow me access to Mobius' hideout, and then naturally confront Mobius. They suspect he has my brain, which I need if I want to actually leave this place, so for the time being, our motives are aligned. They do a lot more talking before finally cutting me loose, allowing me to freely explore the mount house that is Big MT. And while yes, the offbeat humor can actually be enjoyable at times, the real joy of this DLC is couched in its emphasis on exploration. The Big MT is actually a misnomer. There's a ton of stuff to see, explore, and collect. There's secrets packed into every corner of the map, carefully hidden and protected by clever puzzles that turn a lot of what I've come to expect from New Vegas on its head. There's also a ton of substantially more challenging and unique enemies patrolling the place. A couple of which I've already met in the Mojave, explaining their origins at Big MT. This all creates the feeling that this place was truly home to some supremely fucked up, unethical experiments, and the minds that were creating these things before and after the war just didn't have the best interests of humanity at heart. Their dangerous and unstable creations are haphazardly discarded around the crater, and the same goes for their more beneficial creations that could actually help the people of the wastes. The minds locked up here are only interested in poking and prodding to satisfy their base egos and curiosity. But going back to those enemies, they are absolutely merciless. The robot scorpions of Dr. Mobius are in particular some level of pure, undiluted frustration and evil. They come out at the most opportune times to maximize their pain in the assery. They hit hard, they absorb a ton of damage, and explode after being killed. Then there are other brainless victims who didn't take to the brain scooping as well as I did, and now they just roam the creator attacking anything they see. There's also these fucking nightmarish exosuits with skeletons trapped inside them that just laugh off damage and obliterate anything with big guns. If Honest Hearts was a joke for a high-leveled character in the risk-reward department, Old World Blues is its polar opposite. This DLC is challenging, but the reward is by far some of the best gear this game has to offer. It's not only gear, but also services the player is able to unlock while exploring the facilities. I would occasionally find holotapes that I can then feed to the central intelligence unit back at my apartment atop the think tank. The sink is able to use these tapes to bring certain modules online in my apartment each with a distinct persona that offers all kinds of services from buying and selling goods to healing me and installing cybernetic implants. 
All of this incentivizes exploration, but even if these goodies weren't strewn across the big empty, exploring would still be rewarding because it's actually fun. Each lab contains many secret projects the researchers there had been developing. There are terminals with interesting lore, there's detailed, varied, and thought-provoking locales that are intrinsically interesting to explore, and puzzles meant to pace it all out. I was beginning to think after all my time spent in New Vegas, Obsidian didn't quite get the appeal of exploring spaces that didn't have people in them, but then comes along Old World Blues to disprove that notion entirely. I was quick to judge and dismiss the writing earlier thanks to penis feet, but free of the think tank, the writing does actually get a lot smarter. Obsidian begins layering plot, environmental storytelling, lore, and even a little bit of character building to construct something really special. I won't go super deep into this because this video is already getting too long, but one of the items I have to retrieve has me running through a test facility, designed after one of the main scientist's experiences as a high school loser. It's clever, unique, and completely unexpected, and that's really how this whole DLC can be summarized. But then they also work in heavy shit like this into the story. Almost did. Got my answers. You're Elijah. He met the gods in this place. Did a good job of making them question the way of things. Do you know where he went? He's gone to the Sierra Madre. That's a special kind of hell. He won't come back. Someone smarter and tougher is going to kill him. If the Madre doesn't. Tying together the other DLCs, we hear Christine and the courier who is helping her track Elisha. Elijah came to the Big Empty looking for tech and answers like any techno psycho brotherhood flunky, and he wreaked so much havoc in the crater that the think tank barely is able to recall what he even wanted. This is also where he managed to get those infernal explosive collars. Christine was tracking him because of her orders to kill him as we learned in Dead Money, but Ulysses is an unknown, though he keeps referring to my character as though he's got a vendetta against me, which is a neat bit of foreshadowing. Oh yeah, and this is all hidden in some off-the-beaten-path cave I just happened to stumble into. But back on the main trail, I managed to scrape together all that tech the Think Tank wanted for some reason. And with their assurances, I'm ready to hit up Mobius' place in the Forbidden Zone. When I get there, I face down his giant robo-scorpion, and then storm his lab, which looks identical to the Think Tank, except it's only Mobius looking like he's seen better days. He doesn't attack on sight or anything, he barely recognizes my presence until I confront him and tell him that I'm there to stop his reign of terror. He's very quick to explain his side of the tale though, and immediately reveals I've been bamboozled. He left the think tank a long time ago after having reprogrammed his friends to forget their old identities and trapped them in a loop that kept them forever stuck in Big MT. He then did the same to himself to install himself as Mobius as a further attempt to keep them too scared and distracted to leave. This was because Mobius recognized how dangerous these old scientists were, and the world just wasn't ready to deal with them. None of this was going to work forever though, and that's where the brain extractions came in. They were trying to figure out how to get their brains installed into human bodies so they can leave Big MT. My character's brain extraction was the first one that actually worked thanks to the bullet in the head he took at the very beginning of the game, and this taught the think tank all they needed to actually perform these brain transplants successfully. All the technology they then asked me to retrieve were actually needed for the brain transplant surgery. Mobius hoped he could have this technology destroyed when I came to visit him, but seeing as they already copied the schematics, that route just isn't going to work. Mobius suggests I make up some absurd lies that will scare them into not trying to leave, ideally invoking the Mobius story some more seeing as it's been so effective this long. He then just well, lets me take my brain back, seeing as his plan now rests in my hands and keeping my brain away is kind of pointless. So I meet my brain and it's really got a mind of its own. We have seen some incredible sights, haven't we? Jason Bright and his followers launching into the vast unknown. Helios One coming back online. Jason Bright and his followers launching into the vast unknown. Helios One coming back online. Jason Bright and his followers launching into the vast unknown. Helios One coming back online. Jason Bright and his followers launching into the- But after some convincing, it agrees to be reunited. And then it's time to decide what to do with Mobius and the rest of Big MT. And after seeing what they've been producing over the years... Bro, 
my decision doesn't require much deliberation. I then return to the think tank like Caesar returning to Rome and give those big brain stealing robots a taste of their own medicine. With them silenced forever, I claim the big empty for myself, along with all of its technical marvels and conveniences. It has all led to this. One final DLC, one last mystery to solve, one final road to walk. By the time I got to Lonesome Road, I had quite a few questions. Who is Ulysses? Why is he obsessed with symbols, history, and my character? What is this divide I keep hearing about? Why is survival such a terrible skill in a post-apocalyptic game? How am I still a wasteland messiah despite all the atrocities I've committed? All these answers and more lay at the bottom of the jagged terrestrial scar that is the divide. There are messages all over the place left behind by Ulysses, luring me deeper into the divide. Eventually, I set my eyes upon it. Some deep fracture running along the earth, swallowing a city and masked behind a dusty orange haze. I've seen quite a few ominous and spooky locales in this game, and the DLCs especially, but the divide is honestly something special. The Sierra Madre was spooky in a ghostly, haunted, nightmare sort of way. The divide is spooky in a grounded, candid sort of way. Like finding a sick homeless junkie in an alleyway still shooting up beyond the capability of understanding the level they had fallen to. It's just... real. I slip into a bunker that's unnaturally quiet. I start doing my usual poking around, activating things whose purposes I don't even know, opening doors and containers, and just generally making myself at home as I look for things to take. There I meet Eddie, a friendly iBot who seems to have history with this place, but it's not really able to communicate with anything more than beeps. He joins up with me and is able to activate and unlock different things for me to interact with, and in doing this he reveals what's being hidden in this missile silo. An intercontinental ballistic missile. I mean, it does make sense to find a nuke in a missile silo, but it's a cool reveal anyhow, and it starts to explain what happened to the Divide if these things are just lying around for some idiot with an eyebot to trip over. We make it topside when I'm finally contacted by the man himself. Now see the road of the old world paves, and what the lights of New Vegas promise if they haven't blinded your eyes. I'm a courier. Courier 6 was Courier 6. Like you, and not like you. In all the ways that matter. Ulysses has this growling, rumbling voice that he's able to broadcast directly through Eddie. There's also this weird feedback mixed in with his voice, like he's got ghosts speaking along with him. Lending everything he says this haunted vibe, which is fitting for someone claiming to be speaking for history. And just like history, everything he says is vague, with plenty of room for interpretation. Just the manner in which he speaks, frugally leaving out words and phrases, gives a lot of his statements double, triple, quadruple meanings, and this is probably done for a thematic and story purpose. I'll get back to the story purpose because Obsidian is spinning some insanely intricate yarn, so for the time being, we'll just appreciate that the guy who keeps harping on history speaks like he himself is some fractured, ambiguous historical account. Ulysses makes it clear though, even if he's leaving out the why, that he wants me dead. He was originally going to be the courier to handle the platinum chip, the upgrade storage device Mr. House needed delivered to the strip to finally unlock the true potential of his security systems. But he saw my name on the list directly below his, so in passing up the job, the platinum chip fell into my hands. He knew what the chip was and what it meant to certain people in the Mojave, and he figured this would probably have led to my death and he'd have his revenge. And he was right to a degree, he just didn't expect my character would actually survive a bullet to the head and more or less claw his way out of his own grave. So that's why he sent out the radio broadcast inviting me to the Divide. He figured it was time to stop leaving things to chance. He's also got a real problem with old world tech like the platinum chip and my iBot companion Eddie. And he's got an even bigger problem with people who rely on that technology and drag it around with them, like me. So that starts to answer the why behind his beef with me, but not quite. He's also got promises to keep to others, but once again, he's vague answering questions with just more questions. 
He mentions the deranged mutant ghoul people I fought a little bit in the bunker earlier. These people were soldiers once for the NCR and Caesar's Legion, but the radiation turned them into feral monsters, while the constant sandstorms of the Divide tore at their skin, turning them into marked men. They now defend the Divide, kept alive by its radiation, and using materials in the Divide to kill trespassers like me and Ulysses. Finally, we got the nukes that are scattered all over the place here, the devices that managed to create the Divide in the first place. Flight-capable nukes still docked in their berths can be found scattered throughout the underground tunnels all over the region. Along with individual warheads that have been tossed around by storms, collapses, and conflicts, waiting to be activated by someone. Someone like me. Ulysses tells me there's a detonator hidden somewhere in the ruins of Hope Villa below that will let me wake up those warheads and give me access to different areas of the Divide. He figures I'm going to need that if I'm going to reach him, which is something he absolutely wants, even if he still wants me dead. His motives are about as clear as a dusty sky, and while I'm left to explore the ruins, I'm able to find some journals of his that explain his own history. But we'll get back to that. I gotta talk some gameplay here because on top of this DLC having some real weighty story stuff going on, it's also pretty damn fun too. I thought the Big Empty was fun and rewarding to explore, but the Divide is absolutely more up my alley in terms of a Fallout exploration experience. This is probably a subject due its own video or something, but exploration in Fallout games, at least the post Bethesda 3D ones, can vary greatly depending upon the places you're exploring. Combing through houses looking for food and meds has a different sort of vibe from plundering pre-war research facilities for lost technology. And that is different still from fighting through old pre-war military bases that are usually loaded with guns, ammo, armor, and equipment. Now, this is all entirely personal preference, and really a variety of exploration destinations is most ideal, but plundering military installations in these games has always gotten my happy juices flowing to my brain more than the other types. I don't know, I think I just like Bang Bang more than Pew Pew. And Old World Temples of Destruction give a lot of the former, and Lonesome Road is all about that on the greatest scale possible. Everything shoots with a huge breadth of Bang Bangs, and good god, you're gonna find every manner of firearm in this place with more ammo than you'll ever need for the rest of the game. There's chests and containers all over the place, really powerful and expensive guns just lying about like discarded tin cans. And then to top it all off, Eddie is able to unlock these remote commissaries that allow me to trade to my heart's content and repair anything. Big MT was great for the looter hoarder in me, but the divide is nothing short of paradise. Once again, this ties back to the thematic line the story is trying to construct about the player being the ultimate god of doom and death when the thing that gets them most excited here is all the tools of destruction left behind to be repossessed. Navigation of the Divide is similar to dead money in paths frequently diverge and meet dead ends and obstacles, while shortcuts exist for those looking hard enough and possessing the required skills. But where dead money really got tedious and boring from its samey trap-laden villa streets that made getting lost a common occurrence, the Divide is a lot more visually stimulating, with plenty of landmarks to keep the player oriented while somehow managing to feel just as oppressive and dangerous. This just makes for a superior exploration experience in my opinion. The overall layout of the Divide is one long road with many side attractions, but that seems fitting for a DLC titled Lonesome Road, and is better from a gameplay perspective. After exploring Hopeville, I finally found that detonator Ulysses mentioned, and this really lets me elevate the Bang Bang game. This allows me to play some tricks on the locals, unlock hidden treasures and shortcuts, and of course, progress to the next stage of the DLC. Eddie and I descend into the collapsed underground tunnels that are filled with some kind of new breed of mutant. These fast, hard-hitting tunnelers most likely existed before the Divide was blown to hell recently. They probably have existed since the early days following the Great War, hidden until the dormant nukes broke open the sky above them. They're a challenge to fight, and they like to gang up and ambush. And they will ambush a lot in this underground section. Once again, I'm able to break to the surface and see the sky again, and Ulysses contacts me through Eddie. Ahead is the high road, but it's still a long ways from the Divide. This time, Ulysses goes into the major factions vying for the future of the region the NCR, the Legion, and House. And all of them have earned his disapproval for one reason or another. The common reason though is that none of them seem to have a real plan for the future despite their self-righteous claims otherwise. 
Ulysses' thesis is a simple one. All three of them look to the past for how to live in a world that has no use for their old ideas. There's a reason the old world died, and living on those old world ideas guarantees death, especially if those factions aren't willing to address the reason for the collapse. But in the Divide, he saw something different. What used to be here was a prosperous city living amongst the many pre-war ruins under the storms that plagued the lands even before its fate. But according to him, these people had a real vision for the future, something that didn't rely on old world thinking. He's vague on what that actually is because that's a blank we the player are really meant to fill in with what we think is a valid post-war ideology. But Ulysses really began to believe in it, and maybe another courier. The player's character has a deep past tied to the Divide. It was a place the player frequented a lot many years ago, running countless deliveries along a dangerous route nobody else wanted to travel. This is what kept the Divide alive and what actually led to its discovery by the NCR and then the Legion. That's how Ulysses found it while acting as a spy for the Legion while working as a courier. By the time he stumbled upon the Divide, he was really starting to doubt what the Legion stood for, even though he was high enough up there to have personal discourse with Caesar himself. It was in fact Ulysses who discovered the Hoover Dam, the NCR, and New Vegas and reported it back to Caesar. But he was disappointed when Caesar began to obsess over the Old World relics the same way the NCR did, and he knew this would just eventually lead to the destruction of Caesar and the Legion, as is always the case for those blinded by what was the past glory of the Old World. And herein lies the brilliant undercurrent of these four DLCs. They all found unique ways of saying the same thing. The past lies in the past, and trying to resurrect it almost always has troubling consequences for a payoff that is usually less than the price paid. This all begins to sound like a very personal story being told by some of the original creators of the franchise so many tumultuous years later, but that's going to be a topic for another day. I just can't help but feel there's some parallels between Obsidian and Ulysses worth mentioning. Ulysses naturally holds me accountable for what happened to the Divide. Because of my efforts to open reliable trade routes, the NCR was interested in it to fuel their expansion west. Meanwhile, the Legion was interested in it as a ways to stymie that expansion, a vulnerable link in the NCR's supply chain that, if cut off, would bleed the bear and soften it for the war ahead. But my greatest sin was my final delivery, a certain device the NCR discovered in some enclave ruins back west. It was sent to the Divide in the hopes that the locals would know more about it, and I was the one to deliver it. Ulysses isn't sure if I was ignorant to what this device was capable of, or if I knew its true purpose, but intent is not important to this man, only actions and consequences. And judging by the facts that I delivered the Platinum Chip and picked up Eddie once I got into the Divide speaks to some sort of attraction I have with Old World Relics. And it's that attraction more than anything else that makes me incredibly dangerous. The evidence of which lies in the Divide, which was utterly destroyed when that device I delivered woke up and detonated many of the underground nukes in the region, tearing the land apart in something just truly apocalyptic. Ulysses who was there to watch me deliver it and then witness the detonation and death of a place he was beginning to call home was only kept alive by the fact that he had an old world flag on his jacket and the awakened automated medical bots were able to save his life as they mistook him for an American soldier. This traumatic experience is what shaped his need for revenge against me, though from his perspective it's more like justice and maybe even a service for the world to stop this person who just can't stop meddling with old world relics. But what's most interesting here is not what Ulysses is saying, but my choice of responses I can feed back to him. If Ulysses speaks so vaguely it borders on riddles, then what the player can say back is like if Freud and Plato had a baby. What I can pick as a player are some of the most carefully worded player choices I've seen in a video game. Each choice can be interpreted in so many ways, furthered by the lack of voice acting which prevents even tone of voice creating a bias for the player's interpretations. And these interpretations can range from my character being an amnesiac who probably can't remember shit after getting shot in the head, to someone who is even more cagey and vague than Ulysses and will outright lie to this man about his own past and intentions. 
Or maybe Ulysses really does just have it all wrong. But this is why Ulysses isn't interested in the whys of my character's past actions, because he knows he just cannot believe anything he's told. And goddamn, if this is not some next level commitment to a player's role-playing experience, then everything I've said about this game is invalid. Because I look at these cleverly written choices and the carefully constructed story Obsidian made to house them, and I'm almost awestricken. Going deeper than this is well beyond the scope of this video, but this commitment is too consistent all the way through the base game and the DLCs to have been an accident. Obsidian is making a statement here, and unfortunately that's really all I got time to say, because we still got a lot more road to cover. With the dangers of the high road behind me, I stumble upon another missile silo where, without prompting, Eddie activates a console that has a lever I can pull. So, naturally, I pull said lever and, uh... So, I accidentally launched a nuke, and, uh, really, Ulysses might actually be onto something when he criticized my compulsion to mess with things I literally don't understand. Fortunately, it just looks like it hit another part of the divide, so it probably just killed some mutants, but maybe I should stop pulling levers here. So I head into the next bunker and proceed to pull another nondescript lever, but this just activates an elevator that proceeds to take me down through a nest of tunnelers. And between the Michael Bay explosions and the noisy elevator, the tunnelers lose their shit and start storming the elevator. For several minutes, Eddie and I fight off the disgruntled mutants until we finally hit the bottom of the cavern. Back outside, the defied finally stretches before me. A large gash in the world carved from the underground bunkers that once existed there. Some evidence of them still exists, but most of what's down there now are simply the remains of the city that had been swallowed whole by the collapse. Ulysses continues to lure me deeper in towards his hideout at one of the facilities at the end of the unnatural canyon. So Eddie and I press on, battling marked men, detonating a few warheads, and trekking through yet another tunneler-infested underground section. When we emerge one last time, Ulysses contacts me and finally reveals what this is all about. It turns out he just needed Eddie. He's carrying launch codes for the remaining missiles in the Divide, and Ulysses has a few places he'd like to wipe off the map, starting with the NCR West, the Legion East, and New Vegas. He's got a vision for the future, and that future needs a clean slate to get it going. He knew I'd bring Eddie along because, well, I got that habit of meddling with powerful relics, and with my final delivery now complete, he doesn't really need me anymore. He's able to remote control Eddie and fly him off to his bunker at the end of the canyon, leaving me alone to contemplate my multitude of mistakes up until that point. Without Eddie, the next few encounters are a little more challenging, but with some shooting, nuking, and a little bit of perseverance, I make it inside the facility and am quickly reunited with Eddie. Presumably, Ulysses got what he needed from the bot and just stuck it back into one of the charging pods, which made it a lot easier to find him again. The two of us make it to Ulysses, who is hanging out in a silo packed with missiles and warheads, one of which is ready to launch on command. After all this time, I finally come face to face with the man who's been shadowing me for years, apparently. He's surprisingly curt here, simply stating I destroyed the nation he could have called home, so now he will destroy the one I call home. He really had no interest in killing me to begin with, because in his eyes, I stand for nothing, so killing me is really just worthless. But we're face to face now, and there's really only one way that this is going to end. Ulysses was the toughest anything I fought in this game, and his personal healing bot didn't help. Which, you know, he was bitching at me for dragging Eddie along this entire time, meanwhile he had a pocket healer bot. Maybe he was trying to level the odds or something like that. Uh, 
who knows, he's dead now, and all that's left to do is stop those nukes. Well, kind of. The abort sequence is overwritten, but I could try to circumvent that and disable the nukes. Or I could redirect them. Seeing my karma was still just much too high, and this being a playthrough where I was siding with Mr. House, well, I did the only sensible thing. With nuclear hellfire raining down upon the heartlands of the East and West, I make my way out of the Divide, a job well done. Ulysses, though, left one final message for me back in the Mojave. My message is this. The destruction that has been wrought at the Divide, or elsewhere, if you can stop me, it can happen again. It will keep happening. If war doesn't change, men must change, and so must their symbols. Even if it is nothing at all, know what you follow, Courier. Just as I followed you to the end, whatever your symbol, carry it on your back and wear it proudly when you stand at Hoover Dam. It's kind of embarrassing it has taken me this long to finally play all these DLCs. I remember playing Dead Money and Honest Hearts years ago and being unimpressed. Meanwhile, the cynic in me assumed all the praise Old World Blues and Lonesome Road received was maybe just a little overblown. These preconceived notions, while not making me actively avoid playing the DLCs, never made them a priority either, and so it's taken an improbable 10 years for me to finally give them a serious shot. And now that I have, all I can say is, uh, yeah, the praise is warranted. Looking at Dead Money first, it had its weaker moments, particularly in the villa. That exploration segment lasted way longer than it ought to have, and a lot more linear than it at first appears. But once inside the resort, things improved drastically, and the thrill of solving the mysteries of the casino and the companions really carries the experience all the way to the end. It's fun. More frustrating at times than it needed to be, but overall really enjoyable. Honest Hearts is really the low point of the four. It's not bad, but it's just not good either. I don't want to make direct comparisons to other games, but Honest Hearts is far from the worst DLC I've ever played, I will say that. The story is a lot more straightforward and rigid than any other offerings of New Vegas, and there just isn't a whole lot to explore story, lore, or character-wise. The best part of the DLC is Zion National Park itself, but it's nowhere near as compelling as really any of the other settings in the base game or the other DLCs. It's a park filled with caves, camping grounds, and tourist shops, which is... Eh, okay. Couple that with some incredibly bland quests, and my time in Zion was really not that enjoyable. Old World Blues was the one I was, oddly enough, most concerned about, because I always see people hyping it up, and when I see lots of hype, my bullshit meter starts to tick. So I went into that one with a more critical eye than the others, and aside from a few penis feet, it's a really solid expansion. The first two I didn't feel comfortable calling expansions. Adventures seemed more appropriate, but Old World Blues definitely fits the bills for expansion. A decent sized, fully detailed map completely open to explore, lots of lore, story, dialogue, and very unique quests and puzzles, and a ton of new weapons, armor, items, enemies, and a snazzy apartment packed with useful tools and services, this DLC has all the bases covered. If you were getting tired of the grim serious mood of the rest of the game, tired of having to deliberate all those morally great choices, then this DLC is going to be right up your alley. They cranked up the wacky and just had fun making this thing, and while that's not really my thing, I can definitely see the appeal to those who needed a breath of fresh air. The heavy emphasis on exploration with this DLC was the right call, as even the base game lacked that iconic go-anywhere-do-anything approach Bethesda brought in with Fallout 3, instead opting for a more structured approach to open-world game design. But this DLC felt like Obsidian's take on the Bethesda formula. 
that amusement park vibe that Fallout 3 always gave me. It's fun and just ekes out ahead of Dead Money for the number two spot if I were to start ranking these things. But number one goes to Lonesome Road, hands down. The other three I had some level of familiarity with, even if Old World Blues I was pretty far off base with, but Lonesome Road I had genuinely no idea what this was about. I knew it had Ulysses, a lot of the color red, and the map was very jagged and challenging to navigate. In a lot of ways, this DLC comprises everything I love about New Vegas. A deep, intricate story very heavily laced with lore and backstory that gives that oh-so-satisfying feeling of revelation. Plenty of interesting, varied locations with a lot of tone and atmosphere to explore, and guns. Lots of guns and enemies to use them on. Throw in some hidden audio logs and item caches and we got ourselves a solid Fallout gameplay experience. But going back to the story, they didn't just stop with a gripping plot, they also used it to broadcast some heavy themes and even meta-commentary on the nature of single-player driven game experiences, and what I suspect to be gripes with the game industry as a whole. There's so fucking much buried in New Vegas in general, things I haven't seen until I played through Lonesome Road and got a puzzle piece I'd been missing for all these years. Something just clicked, and it's honestly got me thinking I gotta go back and play more Obsidian games because these people are just genuine artists. It's funny, I started this thing mocking the usual Obsidian circle jerk, and here I am now, an hour later, joining the tug-off. But I just really appreciate what Obsidian has done with this game and these DLCs. I really try not to let Obsidian's take jade me to what Bethesda has done and continues to do with the franchise because Honestly, these two developers make such vastly different games that the only thing really they got in common is that they make open world games that fall into some category of action RPG. But I also can't help but lament knowing that this sort of Fallout experience just hasn't been matched since, and there's nothing on the horizon that looks to indicate another Obsidian-esque spin-off is in the works or is even being considered. Even if they did do it, and Obsidian was the ones at the helm of the project, would it even live up to the bar New Vegas had set? I hate saying never, but this game, now that I've played the DLCs, feels more like lightning in a bottle than just a well-designed game. This was a project these people poured their hearts and souls into, and sometimes that's just a one and done thing. What I do know is, after playing these DLCs and doing this video, I got a whole lot more to say. So stay tuned and consider subscribing so you know when the next video is done. Thank you so much for sticking through this, and I'll see you in the next one.